All right, well, good, uh, good evening. Um, again, everything Christy said, it's a pleasure to be with uh, you. This is different for me, um, just as, as pastor, um, I'm excited. I actually um, was trying to get Father Ricardo, Father John Ricardo, uh, here to do these talks. Um, full disclosure, these are completely his talks. I just stole everything. Um, he couldn't make it, so I said, um, yeah, just give me the content. I'll, I'll give the talks. And um, So what we're going to kind of go through is, um, is the story. But before we get there, I just want to talk a little bit about our parish. Uh, Christy mentioned a little bit about it. Um, for those of you who are members of Sacred Heart, you know that, um, that our mission is to encounter Jesus and to become missionary, missionary disciples. Um, it's rooted in the gospel. It's, it's the mission that Jesus has given to the church. Um, and I'm super excited to be here. I, I, I'm super blessed to have this team um, over at our, our parish and school. And I'm, I'm super excited what God is doing in our parish because um, it is an exciting time to be a part of the church. I don't know how you look at what's happening in our world and in our church, but um, I look at it as an absolutely exciting opportunity because um, you and I were made and created and were born for a time like this. We were made and created for this day and this time. There's, there's no other time that you and I could have lived. We live now in the present moment, 2022. And you and I are made and we are being equipped to be disciples and missionary evangelists in the world because people are starving to hear the good news of Jesus. And what a great opportunity you and I have to share that. And what we're going to do, is, like Christy said, we're just going to come away for a couple of days. And hopefully we are, my, my prayer is that you hear the story that you've heard so many times, that you hear it in a new and a powerful way. And that you want to share it with others. We're not going to talk about anything different, but we might talk about the story in a different way, a different angle, maybe use different language. The language we're going to use is probably going to be a little provocative, but it's meant to be provocative. It's meant to, to shake us, to stir us, because sometimes we can just hear the story so many times we don't realize how amazing the story is. And maybe we'll start the story with this. God wants his world back. I don't know if we, we think about this, but there's a, there's a cosmic battle going on. And um, what we're going to talk about is how the enemy has kind of captured the world, how kind of Adam and Eve threw us under the bus and we've um, inherited everything that they did. But what's at the heart of the story is that God has not given up on us and God wants his world back. And you and I are able to be agents of God. We're able to go into the world and offer something that has power. That has power. This is an author, Fleming, she's a, She's a woman, she said this, in the final analysis, theological speculation can only take us so far. We need to know the story. Um, in our parish, we have a lot of small groups. Um, I know a lot of you have gone on retreats, you've done Acts, you've done Curcio, you've done um, a lot of things. We're doing Bible studies. A lot of us are starting to study. We're starting to get um, excited and inquisitive and we're doing a lot of things, but just to maybe step back again, and to look at the story of what Jesus did for us, which will put in context everything that we're doing, hopefully, in our parish and hopefully um, you're doing. So, our retreat, capturing the big picture, maybe God's plan for the world and our mission in it. We're going to talk a little bit about what is our place? How do we find ourselves? Paul says this in Romans. Paul talks about this. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
It is the power of God for salvation. Paul talks about the gospel as power. The way that Paul talks about it, the gospel itself has power. The gospel is not dependent upon the preacher of the gospel. It's not dependent upon the gifts and talents of the person sharing the story. No, the actual story has power. Sometimes we come to Mass and maybe we look at the priest who's saying Mass or we, we go to another church because so-and-so's saying Mass. Maybe sometimes we think, I, I don't... I don't have what it takes. I'm, I'm not eloquent. I don't have all the answers. Therefore, I'm not a good person to share the story. St. Paul is saying that it doesn't matter who is sharing the story. What matters is the story has power. And when we share the story, there is a power in God's word. There is a power in the gospel. It's good news that the power has a chance to change people, those who are listening. And I hope my prayer is that as we listen to the story tonight and hopefully please God tomorrow, that that power will come into our hearts and it will make a difference. It will change and give us new perspective so that hopefully at the end of our time together, we will recommit, maybe perhaps for the first time, some of you may commit commit for the first time to the Lord, and we will give him everything, all of our life, because we realize what he has done for us. He's not only come to take our world back, but he's come to take you back. He's come to rescue you. Again, that's important. It's very important to remember the power is in the message itself. It's not in the person saying the message. Pope Francis said this about the, the gospel. He said, the message is capable of responding to the desire for the infinite which abides in every human heart. There's just the, the way that we're made, the way that God fashioned us and formed us. He made us to where the only thing that speaks to the depths of our being is his word. Like we were made by the word, formed by the word, for the word, and the only thing that speaks to our heart, the depths of our heart, is the word that made us. So hopefully, uh, as we're kind of going through our time together, we are praying, we're listening, and, and, and this is how I would really invite you to listen. As I'm speaking, hopefully words are coming in through your ears, but what I want you to be attentive to is what is speaking to your heart. And feel free just to check out at different points, to, to close your eyes, to pray. Maybe you brought some notes to write things down because the Lord is here and he wants to speak to you individually. So to be listening from your heart, what God might want to say. John Paul the Great, uh, St. John Paul said this, the initial ordinate proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed and brought to the decision to entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith. Talking about preaching the good news, talking about what happens when someone hears the word of God, when they hear and experience the power, he says, there's an initial ordinate proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed and brought to a decision to entrust himself. Now, no show of hands, because I know some of you are not from Sacred Heart. No show of hands. Um, when's the last time, I just want you to think in your heart, when's the last time you were overwhelmed? by the gospel. It's a big word. When I think overwhelmed, I think like moved to action. I think um, like a, a physical and an emotional, uh, an intellectual being overcome by the power of the gospel. Most of the time, um, you guys are <laughs> praying. We don't go over an hour at mass. I mean, you're hoping we say something relevant, not too long, keep it under 10 minutes, throw a little joke in there, get to the point. Like, 
in, in all love and in all compassion, how have we gotten to the point sometimes where the power of the gospel is relegated to a priest not being boring and getting to a point and not being too long so that we can get out of here? Like Jesus through St. Paul says, the gospel has power to change the world and to change our lives. And there can be a a danger of us losing sight, losing the reality of the power of God in his word and in the story. And so just to maybe uh, use an image that might help us understand why the story is so important and why it's so powerful. This is maybe a picture of, of D-Day, Normandy, 1944. You guys are mostly all familiar with this day. Why are they there? Maybe they heard about the cheese in France. <laughs> or the Bordeaux wine. Maybe uh, got a bunch of dudes in there. Maybe they're going to check out the Mona Lisa. They heard the Mona Lisa was fabulous in France. They wanted to check it out. The beaches were really nice. I don't see a whole lot of bathing suits on. No, we all know why they're there. We look at this picture and we are proud. They're there to fight. They're there to fight because um, a a dictator, an evil dictator, has come over from the east side from Germany, and he is infiltrating and moving in across Europe, and he's taking over, and he's killing, and he's pillaging, and he is evil, and he has to be stopped. And we understand that these men and women are there to fight and to rescue someone. It's clear. Now, why is he there? This sweet, saccharine, gentle picture. You might not have an answer. It might be vague. Sometimes we look at Jesus and we we describe Jesus uh, as gentle, meek, mild, humble, These are all very true about Jesus. But the reason Jesus is there is the same reason that these guys are here. Jesus came to fight for us. He came to rescue us from an evil dictator that has captured us and controls us and manipulates us and wants to kill us. And Jesus came to rescue us. That's really the whole complete picture when we think about it. Just to maybe put this in context, um, just imagine you were in Europe, maybe in France. You're with a friend. Your family has been killed by Nazi Germany. It's been couple of years, you're eating on rations, you're just kind of surviving. Everything is drab and buildings are destroyed. And the newspaper kind of shows up. And your buddy's reading the newspaper and you ask, huh, what's, what's on the news? And your buddy says, oh, just a you know, Allied armies landed in Normandy. They're advancing in. Wonder what's happening with the weather. Let me turn the page. Like, no, probably you would respond like, what? This is not just news, this is good news. Someone has finally come to rescue us. Praise God. Read the article. Tell me about it. After giving up or maybe giving up hope, someone has finally come to rescue us. 
The gospel is infinitely greater good news than that. It doesn't even, it doesn't even compare. We're talking about God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has come down from heaven to be with us, to become one of us, to rescue us from an evil, tyrannical creature. that enslaves us. This is of biblical proportion. And sometimes we read the Bible and then we're just like, eh, I'm just gonna read Genesis chapter one, read little Ephesians, listen to what God's saying. Hopefully today and tomorrow we, we begin to see new the power power of the gospel. We're going to slowly go through uh, the kerygma. For some of you who maybe are familiar, that's a fancy word. Uh, The good news, uh, kerig is someone who um, carries a light bearer. Um, So the kerygma is basically, um, we have traditionally heard it in in various ways. Um, I have it up here in, in four different, three different ways that we can look at four parts of it. We can look at the kerygma like the good news of the gospel like this. The goodness of creation, so we know that God made everything good. We can look at then sin and its consequences. And then God's response to our sin. And then our response to what God has done for us. That's kind of the basic flow of the good news. That flow. God made everything good. There was sin and its consequences then God responds to our sin, and then what is our response to what God has done for us? Maybe we can ask these questions and attach these questions to this kind of flow, right? To the goodness of God's creation, we can say, why is, some, why is there something rather than nothing? Why did God create? Why is there something rather than nothing? Secondly, why is everything so obviously messed up? If everything was created good, why are things so screwed up? We live in a broken world. This world is messed up. Like we just have to turn on the news right now and we can see, we just don't understand what's happening over in in Russia and the Ukraine. It just doesn't make sense to us. Why would two people be doing this? It's, It's messed up, right? Thirdly, we can ask the question, what if anything has God done about it? Why doesn't God do something about it? And finally, how should I respond once I understand what God has done? What we're going to do for our time together is maybe be, make it super simple. Um, I think what we try to do in our preaching is hopefully you guys go home remembering something. Um, if it's not one thing, hopefully it's now four things. Um, we're just going to attach some simple words to these, this flow. Created, captured, rescued response. You and I were created. The enemy captured us. Jesus came to rescue us. And we are called to give a response. Super simple. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, one of my, my heroes, my fans, uh, just, I'm a fan of his. Um, if you go through his spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius of Loyola always asks us, to pray for a grace. So when we're praying, we just don't pray um, just half-heartedly. We pray, Lord, this is what I want. I want to receive this grace. So in each one of our talks, we'll have four talks. We have one tonight and three tomorrow. Tonight we're going to be talking about creating. What does it look like? We're going to ask for the grace from God for wonder and trust. What I want us to receive is a new sense of wonder and trust in God. Wonder at his creation, wonder at why and how he made us, wonder at who we are in part of his creation, and because we are so filled with wonder, we want to trust God. How can we not trust God when we understand how big and how magnificent and how incredible he is? That's the grace we're praying for tonight. And tomorrow we're going to 
We're gonna hear about captured and we'll pray for this grace of despair. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Tomorrow, it doesn't sound like something we'd wanna be praying for, but it'll make sense tomorrow. Then we're gonna pray for unshakable confidence and gratitude and surrender and courage to God. So why don't we, um, why don't we pray right now for this, this grace of wonder and trust. Loving Father, I am, um, I'm just so grateful that we have this opportunity to come and, and to hear about your son Jesus and what you have done for us. To hear that you, um, you would not be selfish with your love, that you would not keep your love to yourself, that you would want to create, that you would want to share, that you would want to come out of yourself, that you would want to include us in relationship with you. And that you would make the creation that we see every day so beautiful, so wonderful, so incredible. Lord, stir in us a sense of wonder. Wonder and awe at your creation. Wonder and awe at who we are as part of your creation. And give us a deeper grace of trusting you. Trusting you that you have our best intention. That you are directed to us and you are directed for us. Continue to bless our conversation tonight, our prayer tonight. Come and be with us. Teach us to see you in a whole new way. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Maybe to, to zero in on, on created, this theme of created, right? We're going to talk about two things tonight. The absolute uniqueness in the biblical creation accounts. And we're going to talk about uh, Genesis. Um, the uniqueness of creation and Genesis. Let's talk about... Genesis 1 and 2. Um, for those of you who have started reading the Bible or maybe are veterans of it, you know that um, the Bible is made with different, it's written with different genres. So there's prophecy, there's poetry, there's historical narrative, there's letters, there's gospels. There's different writings which are to be read in different ways. Some of them are, are mythical stories. In other words, they um, are meant to tell us in a, in a myth something that can only be um, told in a story because they have deeper meaning and it's, and it's hard to say exactly what it is. Um, for example, like in Genesis, it says, um, on the fourth day, God created the sun. So how can you have a day without the sun? And so the writer's trying to help us understand like just a deeper meaning of the profundity of creation and, and how beautiful it is. Well, Genesis um, is very much in that same vein. And as we read in Genesis 1 and 2, we, we hear the story of creation. There are different stories of creation. Um, and if you've ever kind of noticed um, I guess I, I used to read a lot of books about uh, masculine spirituality and um, the different myths and the different um, typology that different cultures have. In the, um, in the ancient Near East, they have this myth about how things are created. Almost every culture has an idea about how things came to be, how things are created. It's amazing when you read and listen to other cultures, how they describe how things came to be. Our Christian perspective is so much better. Um, the, ancient Near East, uh, the ancient Near East, um, they have many gods. Um, they're not like us. They're in charge. They choose to create males um, for slaves, and they choose to create females uh, for pleasure. Therefore, there's really no point in living. There's, no, there's not much to look forward to. And so um, the, the pleasure-pain principle is there. You, 
There's nothing to look forward to after this life and in this life. We really seek the greatest pleasure, the least amount of pain until we die. The gods are not for us. They're against us. And so there's this competition. But as we read Genesis 1 and 2, that's furthest from the truth in our account, in our story that God gives us. There's no other gods. There's only one God, the God and creator of the heavens and the earth. And this God is actually for us. This God creates us particularly out of love and for love for us to be with him now and forever. And these are the kind of the, the truths that we know about our story, the story about our creation. There's one God. He is good. He creates out of love, not out of need. He doesn't create us because he needs us. He just creates us because he wants us. And he creates effortlessly. Everything in us, everything in our person is particularly fashioned by God. The human heart person is made in the image and likeness of God. Think about that. The God that we believe in, we are made in his image and his likeness. There's something about you, there's something about me that reveals the image and likeness of God. How particular, how specific, how intimate that is. The human person is made for communion with God and with each other. And finally, this last one, this is not really a word we use a whole lot. It blows my mind, but the human person is destined to be divinized. Not sure if you know what that means. So there's human and there's divine. Jesus had a human nature and a divine nature. Jesus, who is, God is divine, became man, became human. He shared his divinity with us in the Holy Spirit through power so that you and I who are human can share and become more like God. We can be divinized. We can be like God. We're not, we're not God, but we can be like God, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with God's life. The more we give in to the Holy Spirit, the more we become like God, the more we image God, who we are made like. Beautiful process. That's what sanctification is called. That's what becoming holy is called. Just as Catholics, when we receive the Eucharist, what we're praying is, Lord, help me become like you. By taking on Jesus, I want to become like Jesus. I want to be divinized. I want you to come in, your divine life, to come into my humanity and change me to be like you beautiful image of how God created us, of what he wants for us. Let's look at, at creation. This is a fun, <laughs> this is a fun little, little quote. Um, this is in Genesis. So um, the writer of Genesis is kind of describing what God did. Again, it's hard to, to fathom what God did, but he writes in Genesis, and God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the days and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Now, I don't know if the writer was in a hurry. I don't know if, like, he was... Um, just had a lot on his mind or he was a little overwhelmed by what he was, what God was revealing to him. But uh, I just want to zero in on that, that little tagline, the little footnote. And he made the stars also. I, I want to kind of bring you in because we're praying with, with awe and wonder, right? We're asking God, give me wonder at your creation so that I can trust you. So this right here, this picture, these are not stars. These are galaxies. Galaxies. 
The universe is 46 billion light years across. Just stick with me. Imagine this. The universe is 46 billion light years across. And there are 100 billion, some might say trillion, there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And each one has over a billion stars in them. So a little footnote. And he made the stars too. <laughs> 46 billion light years across the universe. It has 100 billion galaxies. Each one has a 1 billion stars in it. This is the God who created you, who created the galaxies. Look at these beautiful just pictures that we would have put together. The vastness of God who would create this. There are 10 times more stars in the night sky than there are grains of sand in the world's deserts and beaches. 10 times more stars than all the sand, the grains of sand in the world. It's a big number. I'm sure it's a ballpark. <laughs> there are 70 sextillion stars visible in the universe. Now, listen, I, I went to Mount Carmel. I went to VC. LSU didn't help me much, but I, I didn't come up with this on my own. I promise you. I don't even know what a sextillion is, but that's what the number looks like. I promise you it's real. Um, it's, it's hard to kind of to comprehend what this is, but let me maybe help you understand this. Our earth You could fit one million Earths in the sun. One million Earths in the sun. So this big dog, this is one of the, um, one of the stars in the solar system. The name is, I'm going to say it wrong, Canis Major, a.k.a. Big Dog. Apparently, you can fit seven quadrillion Earths in this one star. Now we're getting ridiculous, right? We're getting, like, we're, we're, we're starting to talk about some numbers that none of us use on a daily basis unless you bought Bitcoin at a really, really low, low price and you're killing it right now. I don't know why you're here. You should be on an island watching this thing online. But seven quadrillion Earths in this one sun. Just to have fun, um, so that we can kind of figure out what, <laughs> what's a quadrillion? Like, let's just, how can we understand it? So if I were to ask Sister Claudia to start counting to a quadrillion, just for fun, it would take Sister Claudia 11.5 days to count to a million. It would take her 31 years to count to a billion. It would take her 30, uh, 31,000 years to count to a trillion. It would take her 31 million years to count to one quadrillion. I know. <laughs> We're praying for awe and wonder. 
Remember that, that big fancy, that big fancy, that word? It would take her, again, 31 million years to count to quadrillion. She would have to count to quadrillion 10 million times. There are 70 <laughs> sextillion stars in the universe. We can't even fathom or comprehend the universe. What kind of God do we have? Whatever image of God that you have, it's wrong. Whatever image of God I have, it's wrong. This is the God who created you. This is the God who created me. I kind of slowly breeze through it. It was a kind of a cool image, um, image of a sandcastle. God didn't make this, but <laughs> we use this image of uh, grains of sand. So by comparison, If we were to compare grains of sand to stars, and we would make a sandcastle out of every, so every grain of sand for every star, how big do you think the sandcastle would be? Just grains of sand. It would be five miles wide five miles high and five miles deep. And every grain would be a star. Now, why is all this important? Because, I mean, it's just getting, it's getting ridiculous, right? <laughs> it's important because God knows every one of them by name. Scripture says that. God knows every star by name. There's a particularity, there's an intimacy, there's, a, there's a, just an amazing awe and quality about who God is. He counts the numbers of the stars we hear in Psalm 147. He calls them all by name. Who is this God that loves us? Who is this God who created us? Isaiah 40 says, lift up your eyes on high. Who created all of these? He leads forth the starry host by number. He calls each one by name. And scripture doesn't say he only knows the stars by name. He knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. Isaiah 43, he calls you by name. You are precious in his sight. Precious. He fashioned you. He molded you. And oh, by the way, you are the most precious of all of his creation. Who cares about 70 sextillion stars? You are the prize of his creation. You are the most beautiful. You are the one he chose to share his nature with. He became one of us. The point of all this, hopefully, is just to get us to think about the stuff that we carry, I'm praying for the gift of trust. I know a lot of us, we have anxiety, we have worry, we have fear. I know the things in our life are big and sometimes they're hairy and sometimes they're, they're overwhelming and sometimes we, we don't know the future and we, we want to control and we want to fix things and I know a lot of you have come in here with a lot of things heavy on your heart but I'm here to tell you, you have a God who is big enough to handle whatever it is you're going through. Amen? Amen. And, and if you don't believe that, then I, I got nothing else.
We talk to more about the enemy's tactics, but what he does want us to do is he wants us to mistrust God, to think that God can't handle, he's not worthy of being trusting. But God is so much bigger, and there is only one, and he is all-powerful, and he rules, and he reigns, and he is trustworthy. And whatever it is that you are bringing here tonight, There was nothing too big for God. Peter says this, Peter who would know, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Bring all of your worry, all of your anxiety. God is big enough to take care of us. Fear not, little flock. You are worth more than many sparrows. We're going to slowly uh, prepare for Eucharistic adoration. We're going to have a chance to, to be with our Lord tonight and just to pray with him. Um, just with all of this in mind, I have a few, just a few questions I'd like you to maybe think about and pray about while we're in this time of prayer. First one is this. How is thinking about this, how is contemplating the grandeur of the universe impacting you right now. As you hear of the, the wonder and awe and enormity of God and his power, like what's happening in your heart? What is it doing? What is it stirring up? Secondly, in, in your experience, how many Catholics have been overwhelmed by the message of the gospel and brought to a decision to surrender to Jesus? Like people in your life, how many people have been overwhelmed and have given their life and they're completely sold out? Is it, is it a normal thing that happens? Can you say, I have people all around me who have given their complete life to the Lord? Or maybe it's, you have to look, it's slim pickings. And finally, what is causing you anxiety right now? What did you bring here tonight? Can you bring that anxiety to the one who made the stars. We hear in scripture, everything was made in him and through him and for him. Like the Jesus that is here tonight, the Jesus present in the monstrance who is hiding behind bread because if we truly saw him, we wouldn't know what to do. The creator of the heavens and the earth is in our midst. All things were created through him. All things were created for him. Nothing came to be without him. This is a God who is big enough to handle whatever it is we are holding on to. Can we trust him tonight? I'm going to leave these um, questions up here um, for you to pray with. I know people at home, um, maybe you might want to write them down. Um, just so that you can maybe pray with them throughout the night. Um, at some point, we're going to take them down. Again, just a reminder, we have prayer partners um, in the Northex. If something just came up that you um, would like to bring to the Lord and you might find it helpful for someone else to assist you, someone else to help you, um, again, it's just one or two people. They're just going to be with you. They're going to pray with you and for you on your behalf. Um, they may just stand there with you and intercede for you. It may give you strength. It may give you courage um, to do that. They can pray over you. They can pray with you. If that's a help, they're in the North X. Again, we're going to spend some time with the Lord, and, and we're going to do this in silence. Sometimes we have praise and worship during our adoration, but tonight um, in this retreat context, I really just want us to be with the Lord. Please feel free to pray as you are comfortable. You may want to kneel, you may want to stand, you may want to sit. That is completely okay. In just a second, we're going to bring out Jesus. Uh, the, he who has come to rescue us, he who has come to fight for us. Lord, continue to stir in our heart a sense of awe, wonder and trust.